Good morning, or oh, good afternoon and good evening. Um, welcome to this webinar facilitated by the Climate Resilient Sustainable Road Pavement Surfacing or CRISP program team. My name is Professor Nicole Mietje. Um, I'm the chair for today's uh, webinar. Just a bit of background to CRISP. So CRISP is a research funded um, project or it's a research project funded by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and managed by IMC worldwide through the High Volume Transport Applied Research Programme. It's a five year, this is a five year programme um, and it's funded by FCDO and aims to increase access to transport services, more affordable trade routes and safer low carbon transport in low income countries. The 18 months CRIS project is a multidisciplinary research project which aims to demonstrate technical and economic sustainability of three global best practice road surfacing technologies for the range of traffic and environmental conditions of high volume roads that typical, typically currently occur in low income countries and those that are predicted to occur in the future. CRIS includes partners from the University of Auckland the International Roads Federation, University Putra in Malaysia, the Ethiopian Road Authority, and the University of Birmingham, who will be leading this webinar. Today's webinar introduces a quality control framework for epoxy bitumen from theory to practice and outlines how the application of Fourier transform infra infrared spectrography can, can support quality control. If you've got any questions, please put them in the Q and A um, on in the in the Zoom session. But now I'm really delighted to be joined today by Dr. Meran Eskandari Tobagan. Meran is a lecturer in infrastructure asset management at the Department of Civil Engineering, with a PhD focused in risk management and linear infrastructure <coughs> systems from the University of Birmingham. I'm also delighted to introduce Dr. Estras. Um, Estras is a research fellow and project manager on the CRISP project. He specializes in geotechnical engineering at the University of Birmingham with a focus on sustainable and climate resilient materials for road and railways. You will have seen that the webinar is recorded for academic use. So therefore, without any further delay, I will pass over to our first speaker, uh, Meran. Thank you very much, Nico. Just sharing my screen in a second. There we go. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. Let's just go through the slides now. Okay, so first of all, the purpose um, of this part of the work that um, we have done through the CRISP project. So the CRISP project is about um, assessing the use of long lasting epoxy asteroid. Um, for road surfacing in developing countries. And we have considered um, two technologies, modify epoxy chip seals and modify epoxy asphalt um, surfaces. Um, so these two technologies require precise uh, mixed design of epoxy and epoxy has two parts called part A and B. Um, and obviously mixing it with um, aggregate if it's required for the chip seal. Um, and we did uh, dilute um, this epoxy material with bitumen um, and the mix of these materials, so part A and B and dilution with um, a normal bitumen, it's very, very es essential for the achieving the required quality of the end product. Um, so therefore, um, we started um, by developing a generic framework. And the purpose of the generic framework is um, to have a control system in place um, where we can guarantee um, the, the required performance of the end product as road um, surfacing. Um, before going through the, the framework that we develop, um, um, just I need to clarify these two um, sort of concepts, quality assurance and quality control. You might be familiar with these two anyway, but just going through them. So quality assurance is more on the documentation and planning of the process. So you might have checklists, for example, or you might have a process how to control it. 
Well, um, quality control is the forest, is the test, is the physical verification that we do. So in the road context might be taking core or uh, even visual inspection, but then that is something you're measuring something. So quality uh, control is part of the QA, quality assurance. And QC fulfills quality requirements or activities, while QA provides confidence that quality requirements will be met. So the framework is, is more on the QC process. Um, so the framework, we developed this framework um, using uh, just the literature, and it has been informed by uh, experts, um, uh, uh, which are part of the project, especially um, New Zealand Road Authority, and our partners is Auckland, because they have started trialing um, this technology a while ago. So they have um, this sort of documentation. Um, and then second part, we go through some details of the test, and uh, my colleague Estrus will tell you more about New Zealand and their sort of uh, approaches that we followed. So QC activities, it can have two parts. One part um, is the control of material and methods. On the material, for example, we need to check the epoxy bishamon content. And on the method, it might be compaction through the procedure or ashford laying procedure and so on. And also we can control or we should control the end product, uh, which is road surface. Okay, so it should be um, required. It should, has, uh, it should have the required standards such as smoothness or skid resistance. Um, ideally, you would say, okay, if I know the, all the materials and the methods that I use, and I know that they are up to the required standard, why do I need to go and check the end product? Because if we follow everything, the end product should be okay. But um, in reality, um, obviously, we cannot um, control all the materials, and they might not have enough control over the methods um, on site. Therefore, it is still essential to check and control the end product. Um, as part of this checking the end product, so you have a post-construction um, quality um, um, uh, quality control measures, um, and this this is to make sure you are following the standard and road will be safe to use or is safe to use by the users, and also it is to um, guarantee the expected life of the asset, which is the road itself. Um, uh, so another uh, reason for going through this sort of uh, framework or to do quality control is to make sure that you know that all parties involved in the project, um, as all the stakeholders, they, they have uh, or they are content for their responsibilities. If we don't, we, we don't do that within the framework that you will see in a second, then someone like, um, so you have the end product, it's not as you, as you requested it to be, so it's not up to the standard. And then while you go to find what went wrong, you cannot necessarily find the person or the organization who was in charge for that part of the procedure. So it is important to have this sort of framework in place. Then you know, okay, we check that stage, stage one, we check stage two. Um, so something happened in between that two stages. So then you can go and find uh, the person organization who is accountable for that sort of um, failure or lower quality. And I have to say, because CRISP is about constructability of epoxy material. So it's so what we are you see in, in the next slide is a framework for during and immediately after the construction. But obviously, this quality control or it might be called condition assessment can go on through the whole life of the asset or the whole life of the road. So this is the framework that we came up with. So I'm sorry it is a bit um, large and therefore you might not be able to see its components, but I will focus on different um, um, components of the framework. But as you can see, it has um, uh, material, control of material on the top, and then bottom is um, controlling the end product. Okay, so I will go through the components of this uh, framework in a second. Um, first is control of materials and methods. So it's a combination of in situ and laboratory tests. 
you can start and you should start by uh, controlling the asphalt or epoxy manufacturing um, control. And my colleague Estrus uh, will talk about these two uh, methods, a spectro uh, spectroscopy, FDIR, and also a neutron activation or FNAA. And we have nuclear asphalt um, content gauge as another uh, method um, um, used sometimes for um, come up with asphalt content. By the way, those two on the top, FDIR, FNAA, we use those for um, epoxy control measures. I don't, I'm not going through the details here, just leave it for uh, Estrus to explain to you. Um, this is again normal practice, uh, rheology of bitumen. Um, so there are two methods um, used, um, airjet, which, is, um, which has a laser sensor um, as well, or dynamic shearometer to check um, this sort of characteristic of bitumen. The um, thermal properties of bitumen is quite uh, important and there are procedures to check. Sorry, this is a short sort of webinar, so I don't go through the um, details in here, but we have prepared a report and very soon it will be available for public. And within that um, document, you can see all the relevant standards um, to follow um, for any, uh, any of these tests. You need to also check the aggregate as part of this control of materials and methods. And there are various um, tests according to standards. Um, some of them are uh, quite well known, like Los Angeles test, which is to check the resistance to fragmentation. Um, aggregate impact value, you can see on the top, or soundness, uh, or particle density and water, water absorption. Um, shape and um, is another um, important parameter for aggregate, which we need to check. Now that was on the material and method. And um, next two slides, you can see two different aspects. One of them, so on the pre-construction control measure. So let's say, okay, you check all the material, everything is ready, you have potentially two scenarios. One is repairing an existing road, so it's resurfacing of the road of an existing road, and the other one is construction of a new road. So this slide is about a repairing existing road. So what we really need to do before doing any repair is to make sure the soundness of the existing infrastructure, existing road. Visual inspection is a normal way, it's quite common. This project is about developing countries. This is something that normally use um, all around the world, um, especially in developing countries, visual inspection. But um, the issue with that, it might be quite reasonable price um, for uh, road authorities to use, but there might be bias, there might be human errors. There are then two um, different categories, destructive tests or non-destructive tests. Destructive can be named as a coring, taking a core and test it uh, in laboratory to determine the existing asphalt properties. Or you can do non-destructive tests uh, such as a falling weight deflectometer or um, FWD to determine um, the, the dashboard um, or road properties and its soundness. Um, uh, another thing that um, we haven't covered that much within our CRISP project, but it is very important, is the human aspect, let's say, of um, this quality control. And procurement is, is a key to ensure quality. Now, in developing countries, there might be an issue of uh, not having um, the right um, sort of contractors or um, not having the, the required expertise, but it might be up to the um, road authorities or the government or local government to ensure that local people are trained and are ready and you have a sustainable way of dealing with your road assets. So it's not importing expertise from outside might not be the, 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 the solution or the sustainable solution, but might be required at some stage to at least train local um, companies. Um, now talking about uh, newly built road, 
again, you have that procurement. It is at the bottom, but it's not um, at the bottom or shouldn't be at the bottom of your list. Um, but apart from that, you need to know the ground uh, condition. So it's a newly built road. It is important to know the subgrade, its properties, make sure it has the bearing capacity for your traffic road. Unfortunately, this is something that sometimes overlooked and we don't uh, think ground is part of the whole equation and therefore we just leave it as it is. And we have a very nicely built road but unfortunately on, on a ground which is not prepared or it's not ready or doesn't have the bearing capacity. And therefore we have, um, we might have um, some failures. So there are different um, tests, uh, different um, examination that you can do um, again in situ or take into laboratory uh, as part of ground investigation. And it's, it is again, very, very important. So the list is in front of you. Some of them might be like CBR, well known and, um, well used all around the world, but some of them might be a bit less um, available, like triaxial tests, for example, might not be available everywhere. And But there are some replacement for those tests, and it's important to at least have an indication, have an estimation of soil properties. Um, uh, during construction, it might be part of Q, QA or QC as well, construction method. So we, we really need to have, and this is what we do by the way for uh, Chris project. So we are preparing um, construction method for this epoxy. We are doing a trial in Ethiopia. Um, and we have prepared or I'm um, preparing this construction method, there are documents so the local contractors can follow um, during the construction. There are some tests that needs to be done um, during the construction to make sure that the end product um, is as you expected. And you can see, uh, at least in here, going from a hybrid conductivity, stiffness, and some in situ tests to, for compaction control um, or um, the temperature control. And kind of temperature control is, is a key for epoxy. I'm not going through the details of the range of uh, requirements. Again, if you are interested, um, you can read our reports and you will see more. And we are, hopefully, we, have, we will have publication um, as well on the same. Um, end product, it's post construction. Again, visual inspection, it's quite common, um, but um, we should be uh, um, aware of the bias or errors. You can take cores, it might be destructive, or you can do deflection, um, FWD tests, and so on, or a low weight um, deflectometer to determine um, the sort of uh, properties of the asphalt. There are some non destructive tests, new technologies. Um, but we did some trials um, and I mean, other institutions and other organizations uh, has done this sort of tests as well, geophysical methods such as ground penetrating radar. You can use that to determine the thickness of different layers. Um, so if you just want to make sure everything was uh, built according to your plan, you can use this sort of technologies. They might not be available, might be quite expensive to use in developing countries, but I think it's, they are getting um, uh, get more attention around the world and they're therefore becoming more available. So going back to the framework, um, very beginning at the top, you see the manufacturing of epoxy. And it is important to have that part um, guaranteed and quality controlled before taking the rest of the uh, steps and stages of the framework. Um, so this is um, to do with epoxy itself and the mixes and to have the right mixes. Okay, so talking about this importance of the first stage, I would like to pass it over to Esther to tell you about this FDIR and FNA test and why they are important on what we have done. Esther, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mehran, uh, for your presentation. Uh, well, I think everyone can hear me very well. So 
Thank you also to Professor Nicole for the good introduction she has made. Uh, I now move on to the section of using FTIR for uh, quality control of epoxy treatment. So my part will mainly to quickly remind about the CRISP methodology, but also uh, why uh, we chose to use uh, FTIR for quality control of epoxy uh, modified bitumen, which is uh, intended to be used for uh, modified epoxy chip seals and uh, modified epoxy asphalt uh, surfaces. So CRISPS has not only adopted the use of uh, the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, but also the use of the fast neutron activation uh, analysis. So the methodology for uh, the CRISPS is mainly uh, supported by four main pillars. Uh, we've got uh, the deterioration modeling, then the life cycle analysis, and an anti-fraud framework from which we are making this uh, very important presentation. And then another pillar is the constructability of, of, of the trisections. There is common knowledge uh, in road construction is that the pavement is a result of mixing and blending of various materials. And uh, those materials definitely have different properties and behavior. So for the crisps, we are looking at the surface layer of our pavements using the three technologies, uh, modified epoxy chip seals, modified epoxy asphalt surfaces, and fiber mastic asphalt. But the fiber mastic asphalt is not part of the presentation again. I think there has been another webinar uh, talking about this because today we are mainly focused on the control of the quality for the epoxy bitumen mixes. So the quality of pavement, its resilience and performance are always going to hugely depend on the quality and the proper mixing of, of, of designed uh, materials, but also uh, proper construction and maintenance uh, stages. Why do we go for modified epoxy bitumen? And why is uh, uh, quality control uh, very, very necessary for this type of material? We've got two of the, the expensive and sticky materials, bitumen uh, and epoxy. And because of the two factors, being expensive, being sticky, it's very likely that poor measurements uh, are made. And if you make poor measurements, you get, you're going to get poor results. And the poor results means you're going to have uh, a very poor road infrastructure. So the quality at the mixing plant uh, is not easy, as we might know, particularly in the low-income countries, where there is more reliance on uh, ethics and maybe professionalism of for plant engineers. Otherwise, uh, methods and technology for controlling what has been mixed what uh, the way they mixed it, but also the way they selected it, there, there are very uh, limited technologies for that. So it is in this line that there is need uh, to have a, a quality control uh, for epoxy bitumen mixes. And the method you have to use must also be uh, the one that will help us to protect uh, our plant uh, engineers or plant personnel. Uh, against the fraud. So the method should not only uh, ensure the quality of the materials, but we also give guarantee that uh, uh, people who are doing the mixes at, at the site are not tempted to use the wrong uh, measurements. So the Fourier transform infrared uh, was chosen and uh, is going to be discussed in detail in this presentation because for the fast neutron activation, we still have tests uh, going on. 
In short, uh, FTIR uh, helps us to determine the content of epoxy based on the spectra of peaks, whereas uh, FNAA uh, is, is going to help us to determine uh, the content of epoxy in the mixes based on the oxygen uh, content. Of course, this will be detailed later, uh, maybe in another presentation. So we have uh, prepared uh, 30 samples uh, by mixing two types, each of the two types of uh, uh, bitumen grades. This carry the 60 by 70 penetration bitumen grade and the 80 by 100 uh, bitumen grade. We mixed each of these uh, bitumen with percentages of uh, epoxy ranging between 0 and 35% uh, by weight. A reminder, which I think also my colleague has already mentioned, is that epoxy has got two main parts, two types or two parts. One part, which we call part A, is also called uh, epoxy resin. But the second part, uh, also known as part B, can also be called uh, curing agent or adenine. So these uh, samples we prepared, we tested them uh, using the FTIR uh, machine, which you can see here. And uh, in fact, we take a sample of this spe spe uh, a specimen from the sample and we fix it on the attenuated total reflect reflectance crystal uh, of the FTIR machine. In doing that, we, we're going to pass uh, the infrared light through the material or through the, 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 the specimen. Then part of the light is going to be absorbed, part of the light is going to be transmitted. And we are going to record the spectra. You can record the spectra based on the transmitted light or based on the absorbed light. In this case, we went for the, the, the absorbed uh, light. These are the types of spectra that you can get from your samples. Uh, but for better visualization, it's good to take the data and replot uh, uh, the spectra, maybe using another beta plating plotting software like uh, Excel, rather than keeping them in the Omnic software that the FTIR uh, uses. So for our mixes, we will be interested on this area, the area of the functional groups. And we've got two functional groups. One of them is the carbonyl group. Another one is the sulfoxide uh, sulfoxide group. Those, uh, of course, the, the carbonyl group happens in the region, uh, or the spectra for, for for the carbonyl group is in the region of one thousand seven hundred uh, wavelength, whereas the sulfoxide group is in the region of between one uh, thousand. Uh, and 200 uh, around that area. That's where we got uh, our safe oxide carbon group. So why the two groups are of interest or why do we call them functional groups for the epoxy uh, bitumen uh, mixes? One is that FTIR is going to help us to track the changes during the curing uh, times. So we might know that bitumen uh, has uh, a lot of or many uh, organic uh, molecules and that those molecule, molecules are going to oxidize in contact uh, with air. In fact, uh, after mixing, uh, when you placing the bitumen uh, for road construction, there is quick uh, oxidization as the bitumen uh, enters in contact with air. And this is the one that leads to the bitumen stiffening. Uh, and it's, the, the stiffening is actually due to the uptake of oxygen into the bitumen, which is going to lead uh, to more polarity in the mix. And the, that the polarity is mainly at uh, the location of, of the carbonyl and sulfoxide uh, groups. 
So this polarity, uh, we can see it by the change in the spectral rates and it's going to attract hydrogen, hydrogen ions actually, uh, uh, to increase the stiffness of the bonding. Um, it is believed that a mild uh, oxidation is, is better because it improves the resistance to, to permanent deformation, whereas higher oxidation is dangerous it's behind pavement traveling, cracking, much other damage, and potholes. And that's why uh, when uh, oxidation is excessive, we also call it aging of bitumen or aging of asphalt. So the areas and the heights of the spectra peaks are the functional groups are the ones we are interested in. So we have to pick uh, the, 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 the spectra uh, area of, of, of and height at the, the, the functional group, I mean at the carbonyl and at the sulfoxide groups. And then uh, this is a, a method we use to determine the area and the height, and it could be called baseline uh, or tangential approaches. Then uh, what are we measuring from there? Of course, the area of, of, of absorbance peak for the sulfoxide uh, group and the area of the absorbance peak at the carbonyl groups. In the same time, we need to pick the heights uh, uh, of absorbance peak at around uh, for the, car uh, the carbonyl group. But in this case, we, have, we will tend to have two or different uh, peaks in one. And this is because of um, a delay in the curing agents to get fully reacted. So there is kind of shoulder on, on the carbon, uh, carbon groups uh, peak. Then uh, since curing affects uh, uh, our, our mixes affect the, the, the epoxy uh, containing, containing uh, vitamin. We need to determine uh, what we can call the coefficient of, of curing uh, uh, in the, using the two heights of peaks that we determine. The ratio of them is going to be of interest. So uh, after getting this, we can now plot uh, the concentration calibration curves for our two mixes by actually plotting part A. We remember that our, in our mixes, we have a percentage uh, of, of, of bitumen and a percentage of uh, epoxy. And in the epoxy, we have two parts. There is a percentage of part A or epoxy resins and the percentage of uh, the hardener. So the, the percentage of epoxy resins is going to be plotted against the area of the peak uh, of the sulfoxide group, whereas the percentage of the hardener is going to be plotted against the area of the peak for the carbonyl group. And then we get uh, these uh, regression equations. It's not a straight line because we are dealing with the reactive material. So we also mentioned that we have got uh, effect of curing or short term or aging. For the bitumen uh, mixes, the short term aging is going to usually happen during the preparation or mixing and transport, even compaction of, of, of the bitumen. Uh, in road construction, whereas the long-term aging is going to come uh, uh, due to traffic and maybe exposure to uh, climate. So we have also to determine uh, the curing correction curves. For this, there is a target uh, mix. Although we prepare the range of mixes, there is one of the which is a target, usually in the middle of the range. And that's the one we intending to go and use uh, at the construction site. 
So that's the, the one for which you need to determine uh, the curing curves. So you take that sample, prepare it in the same way we prepared uh, the other samples. But then, <clears throat> excuse me, you will pick the specimen and collect the, the, the spectra for those specimen every five minutes. In other words, it's going to take uh, like one hour after you mixed it, kept it in the, the oven for about 10 minutes, teared it, then remove it from the oven, take the first specimen and test it. That is, we call it the, the, the specimen at zero time. Then every five minutes, you keep uh, sampling. And you will do the same as we did before, determining the areas and the heights for the peaks of the spectral uh, functional uh, groups. And you will also have to calculate another uh, coefficient of curing, but now using uh, the curing correction uh, uh, curves. Once you got that, now it's time for calculations. You are going to find uh, correction factors. We've got uh, uh, a correction factor for the area of the, the sulfoxide group and a correction factor for the area of carbonyl group given by this uh, relationship. Actually, by the area of the sulfoxide group for the zero time uh, specimen, which I explained uh, 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 earlier, uh, uh, over the, the the, the area of C4 group for, let's say the sample you took uh, or the specimen you tested after 30 minutes, something like that. Then you also get the curing corrected values for the area. You remember that uh, in the above, in here, we have part A against this area and this area uh, of the C4 group was determined based on uh, uh, calibration concentration curves. But in this case, that area with the time there, we're going to use the corrected area, corrected area after considering the effect of curing or the effect of short term age. So we take the, the corrected values these corrected values, you take them into this, into this equation, the regression equation, to get the real value of part A. In other words, you replace this by the co its corrected value, and you replace this by its corrected value. So you get new values for part A and part B. And the sum of part A and part B is now the determined FTIR epoxy content. After getting that, you remember that we prepared the samples based on, uh, mainly based on the supplier's uh, uh, advice. We used to call these standard mixes, but FTIR uh, calculated epoxy content can be plotted in relation to the epoxy content that we weighed and put in the samples and see how they correlate. The correlation for the two, for the mixes prepared with uh, uh, the bitumen grade 60 uh, by 70 is given here, a good correlation. And for the standard mixes prepared with uh, uh, bitumen grade uh, 80 by 100 uh, grade is much better. So, as conclusion, we found that uh, epoxy content determined uh, using FTIR was uh, in the range of plus or minus 3.5% uh, percent, uh, compared to the quantities or to epoxy content that we put in the samples uh, when we prepared the samples. So the average deviation was minus 1.82% for the mixes with the 60 by 70 grade. 
and plus 0.22% uh, for the mixes with AET by 100 uh, Bitman rate. So there was strong correlation in, in both uh, cases. Small differences, of course, like this and uh, this, can happen due to lack of the standard. There is no standard. Uh, and human errors, of course, in measuring uh, sticky materials. So it's obvious that FTIR can do the job and be a suitable approach for quality control of epoxy modified bitumen at the mixing plant. So after mixing, ready to go to, to, to the construction site, we can pick samples and go in, in the lab and use FTIR and be able to know, okay, in this uh, mix, there is likely that the, the, the content of epoxy is uh, this amount. So since epoxy improves not only, of course, the resilience against temperatures, we can say that epoxy is the best way or is one of the ways that can help us to achieve this uh, target. Um, that's it, and thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you to both Mehran and Estras um, for the um, excellent presentations. Um, I think Mehran, if uh, Estras, I think you need to stop sharing the screen because I can see myself on the screen. Thank you. Um, as I said, thank you to both um, for uh, exciting presentations. I've got, um, I've got a few questions, so if you've got any more questions, please put them in the Q&A, but I'll read out a, a few questions that have already come in. Um, so one question is uh, about the oxidization level. What could be the oxidization level to categorize into mild and higher aging? I think that might be directed at Estras. Are you still with us, Estras? Yes. Uh, I was asking, uh, you said, what could be the oxidization level to... I, I think you, we, we said in the presentation something about mild and higher aging. So the question is, how does that relate to oxidization levels? Good, good. Um, oxidization can be mainly increased uh, by the temperatures of, 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 of the mixes. So there is a tendency to believe that if you keep the mix at higher temperatures for a long time, then you, you are exposing the up, easy uptake of oxygen into the mix. That's depending on the time and the uh, temperature condition of, of, of the bitumen mix. That's how we're going to classify whether you've got uh, high oxidization or shorter or, or mild oxidation, oxidation. I don't have the ranges in, in numbers to say if the oxidization is this percentage is mild or this percentage is, 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 is higher, but it's going to depend on how long and at which temperatures, because the temperature is the one that facilitates more uptake of oxygen into the mix. Yeah. That's what I can tell. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a number of more qu a number of questions, so I think this one might be addressed at Mehran, but I think between the two you can decide who answers it. Is the addition of epoxy only considered for wearing courses, course applications or base layers as well? Also, is it only in asphalt or sprayed seals as well? I think probably I can take that. So um, within our project, we are just looking at surfacings. Um, so therefore, um, we haven't considered it for um, base layers. But personally, I think there is nothing to stop us um, doing that. And haven't heard if New Zealand um, or other countries, they have done that. Um, but uh, yes, I think potentially you can use it for, for, for example, replacing cement. 
um, if you do for bonded uh, layers. Um, and so, and for, for the other part of the question, we are considering for both asphalt and sprayed sills. So um, that's for that part of the question. Thank you very much. Um, no I've got one question again to Estras, um, and that's related to the FTIR um, analysis. So we talk about part A and part B in your presentation. And part A is linked to a peak at a wavelength of 1,249, and part B is associated with a wavelength of 1,725. Um, is, is there a reason why these two parts are associated with the two different wavelengths? Thank you. The main reason is that the two are not of, made of the same uh, of the same composition. They don't have the same uh, molecules in, in the uh, composition, if I may say it like that. And you in FTIR, depending on the molecule, it's like every molecule is going to absorb or transmit the light in its own way. So they are going to be plotted uh, at different locations of, of the uh, wavelength uh, or wave numbers. That's the one the main reason I, I can tell. If I may add just, just one word, sorry, Nicole. So the uh, colleagues um, in chemical engineering, biology, that's they are more dealing with this sort of technology, they, they use the phrase, it's the signature of that molecule. So that's how they, uh, they can identify different molecules. And this is the wavelength that associated, uh, specifically differentiate those two components, let's say. Thank you very much. So, so can I actually ask a follow on question that Please. the uh, audience might like to know? Does, so we've got bitumen and we've got epoxy in our mix. So when we look at part A and part B and we say these are different molecules, does that tell me something about the either component of the bitumen or the epoxy um, or do the molecules relate to the one or the other? Um, maybe you can elaborate a bit more on that. Uh, Estrus, do you want to take it? I yeah, I mean, I can say ep epoxy and then Estrus, you can add them. <clears throat> epoxy is, um, is a, a oxygen content, um, sort of a high oxygen content sort of uh, component. And therefore, uh, Nicole, to answer your question, if you can um, determine the oxygen content, using these methods, then yes, you can go and um, identify the content of epoxy versus um, bitumen. Estrus, if you want to come in, please. You're muted. Yeah, the, the addition I can make is that uh, the, the, the part B or the hardener, and I also call it the curing agent, is more uh, temperature uh, uh, sensitive. So it's more, uh, it's like an accelerator for uh, mix, uh, reactions between uh, part A and the, 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 the bitumen uh, part of it. It works like a, an accelerator or a catalyst for reactions that take place for the mixing to blend together. Okay, thank you very much. I've got, I've got a few more questions, so we're not running out of questions. Um, this is uh, maybe more to Maran, but maybe both of you. Um, can we introduce a similar line of concept in concrete pavements as well, which can be climate resilient? Potentially, yes, why not? Of course, we, we can. Um, but then one might ask question if um, concrete is, is a climate friendly sort of material. Um, but anyway, we are, there are a lot of roads with um, concrete surfacing and uh, yes, we can potentially look, look into um, replacing some of the materials, I don't know, it might be recycled materials and so on. And we can also have a similar sort of framework um, for that um, as well. So it is both on the material to use and also the procedure for quality control and so on to ensure um, a higher quality and more in line with um, our um, strategy or policy globally to tackle climate change. 
And, and along those lines, I've actually got a question which relates to the modified epoxy bitumen um, surfacing. Is how can water draining quality um, be described of modified epoxy um, bitumen surfacing? Is it capable of draining water or the drainage system on the on either side of the pavement will be heavily dependent on it during heavy rainfall? Well, we got a process for as part of epoxy, uh, epoxy uh, modified um, bitumen. Um, because it's porous, so they can, the, the permeability might be higher, but um, I'm, I'm not involved in designing um, for Ethiopia, but I believe, so my colleague is not here to answer that question directly, but um, there you need to still have drainage system in place anyway. Um, so that, that's my sort of understanding, it's just if you want to come in. You're right, Dr. Mehran. Uh, epoxy uh, is not going to increase porosity of, of the, the asphalt, no. So it's very waterproof tight. And uh, as, of course, we need drainage uh, uh, as we do for other types of surfacing. But it doesn't have any uh, drawback, uh, uh, maybe uh, related to uh, permeability of, of, of the surface, no, no. It's, it's a very good material. We have also maybe to remember that epoxy is probably uh, more expensive when you compare to the other uh, materials we are talking about, like cement or, 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 or on bitumen. But with all the qualities of epoxy, drainage is always mandatory for any type of the road you are constructing. Yeah, I think my understanding is that it is almost no different to if we lay it um, as is, but we can, as I think what Mehran said, we can lay it either as a porous asphalt layer, um, or we can use it as a dense asphalt layer, which is a bit more um, like what's done on bridges, and um, therefore we would then need different drainage systems. But the epoxy itself, um, as Estras has explained, has no negative impact on, on the drainage, on the porosity, but also no positive impact. It's just another material. Okay. Sorry, Nicole, I've seen one on the framework, um, in, in, not in Q&A, but in chat box. Can I? Uh, answer that it was on the framework. Um, is it okay to answer yeah. that? Sorry, so which, it was interesting. So it, I, I, I don't have it in front of me. I was reading it during the presentation, but it was on the uh, national and international level and how a standard organization would push for um, this sort of QC, QA sort of thing. So uh, we have a standard, there are governments um, um, which push for this sort of approaches to be adopted, but um, the, we, we also have a culture of just checking the end product. And uh, talking about developing um, countries, sort of context, um, we might not have necessarily disenforced um, the whole uh, QA, um, QC um, procedure. So answering your question, yes, there are some um, uh, different layers um, from uh, globally standards to more national, but uh, what we really need to do it, is making sure that we have this sort of framework or, um, or more overarching approach to tackle this and we don't just go and check the um, end product uh, and its quality. So we go for stage by stage. Sorry, Nicole. It's all right. I'm trying to, so there are three more questions. I'm trying to get through those before we close. So the next question is um, about recycling of asphalt is becoming more common globally. Um, can you please comment on the potential of recycling epoxy containing asphalt? Um, um, I, we haven't done anything on that, um, but um, it, it might be quite um, reasonable to do so. It might, uh, might be New Zealand colleague um, because they are further into the life cycle of their assets. So they might be thinking now about recycling. But uh, this is something to take away and um, have a chat with the supplier, I think. It's a very valid point. And I think it should be included in our design, uh, definitely, uh, because we are um, doing it for the whole uh, life of the asset. 
Thank you very much. I, I totally agree that it's something that we need to um, investigate um, going totally. forward. Yeah, um, very valid point. Yeah. Uh, a couple more points is, do we know anything about the ductility properties of the um, epoxy modified asphalt? I don't have any sort of thing with me, but New Zealand, I believe they have done it. Uh, and uh, it should be in their reports. Stress, do you have anything on that? I can't tell because we haven't done any tests on ductility or whatever, but yeah. there is certain reassurance that the New Zealand should have because they have done many, many tests. I think it would be for us, sorry, it's just to come in, it might be for us uh, later on in Ethiopia uh, before doing the trial or during the trial, field trial, to do this sort of test. Yeah, yeah. it's probably part of, of that package that is going to come sure. before the constructability of the, the regulation. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read out the final question before I bring the webinar to a close. Um, and I'm hoping this is relatively easy to answer. I, I suspect it, it might not be. Um, it is. <laughs> it's, um, do we need to use the two components, part A and part B, in our construction, our mix? Yes, we do. Um, because one of them, part B, is hardening, uh, as Estrus was explaining. So if you don't you, um, use that, then uh, it is um, not the required material, and you don't get the required specification. So you need to mix those two. Um, and there is an optimized um, level of mixing these two. So that's another thing to check as part of the QC. So, so is, is the challenge really trying to get the mix, the proportions right and not yes. to add too much hardener or too much epoxy Correct. and therefore using the FTIR will tell us a bit um, about um, the, the, the mix really? Yes, correct. Okay. Super. Um, uh, if, if the audience has any more questions, we run out of time now, but we've also got a website, a Chris website. Um, you will also see there's been a, a comment made that we've got a LinkedIn page to continue the discussion. So please do get in touch with us if you have any um, further question. But really, um, for now, I would like to extend a big thank you to our panelists and to all our audience for their active participation. We had some excellent questions. There we go. Just checking who's not, un who's not unmuted or who's not muted. Um, I, I think this has been a truly fascinating discussion and um, hopefully we've all learned a bit, a bit more uh, about the FTIR and I think that actually requires some further development and we already had some thought provoking questions um, that we will take away as the team. I would also like to thank our funders, um, the FCDO and HBD managers IMC worldwide for providing support for projects that address climate change impact on transport systems and of course the IRF for facilitating this webinar. Whilst the subjects we've discussed today are academically fascinating, they also have real world impact. The Chris team will be organizing another webinar in late spring 2022, so please look out for the announcement there. For now, please have a lovely end of the day or start of the day and um, yeah, and enjoy the rest um, of, of the time um, of your day today and hopefully see you again at the next um, webinar. Thank you very Thank much, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.